welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show where we talk about life, death, and experiences somewhere in between. I'm Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and join me as I talk to everyday people with not so everyday experiences. Let's Talk Near Death. As they raced me towards the hospital, I began to see my whole life flash before me. I felt the incredible peace enter me. I could literally feel myself come out of my physical form. What was so bizarre was that I was dead, but yet I was alive. Both hands went straight through my face. As I lifted up into this light, I could see far above me an opening, circular in shape, a tunnel, a passageway between the two kingdoms. I was an atheist. I had no belief in God. But I wasn't near dead. I was actually dead. Welcome back to the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. This is Kirsty Salisbury, the host of your show. And today I've got a slightly different episode for us. This episode unfortunately isn't recorded live. However, I have been given permission to use a previous recording for this episode. So today we are hearing from Ian McCormick. Now Ian McCormick is based here in New Zealand and he was one of the very first near-death experiences that I had heard about. This was many, many years ago, before everything was on the internet, before we had access to a lot of this information on a global scale. And I remember reading about his experience and thinking, hang on a minute, that's a little bit similar to what I went through. And suddenly all of the dots started to join up. I started to understand that my experience had in fact been real and wasn't a figure of my imagination. So today, I wasn't able to get Ian in to chat directly with me. He travels quite a lot. He's quite in demand as a speaker and also in the work that he's doing. But he has given me permission to use this recording. This recording is taken from the Oxford C3 Church, where he shared his experience and shared his message. So you'll understand why he's speaking from a church as you get further into the interview. But this is amazing. It's one that's really close to my heart, very special to me. So I hope you enjoy this episode. At the age of 24, I began to travel around the world surfing, come up through Australia, into Indonesia, and then Sri Lanka, and then down to an island called Mauritius. This particular island had great surf. It was a left-hand surf break. And... um, Beautiful island. I don't know if anyone's been to Mauritius. It's like a honeymoon island. And what was so beautiful about it is that the left, left-hand reef break was breaking on crystal clear coral reef, and you could see the reef. <laughs> Just didn't want to fall on it. Living with these fishermen and diving with them, most of them are Rastafarians, Peter Tosh, Bob Marley. They'd watch more Cheech and Chong movies than I had. <laughs> they said, don't worry, man, be happy. Smoke more hashish. So he blew some, we had some chillums and bongs with him and we became part of the family. Uh, this island was incredibly beautiful, uh, as you can see, turquoise colour. And we would dive on the outer reef for lobster and for crab. We'd dive at night and I was an instructor in scuba, a lifeguard. My mum thought I had fish blood in me. We'd dive this night, it was April the 19th. Um, this thing doesn't seem to want to work. We'll just press another one. 1982, and I dropped into the ocean. As I dropped into the ocean, most Australians will know what this is. Um, I didn't. In 1982, we were reading encyclopedias. There's no internet. There was no Google searches. And so swimming in front of me was what you know to be the box jellyfish, a marine stinger or sea wasp. Not knowing what it was, I thought it was a transparent cuttlefish, and, and I reached out with my leather gloves, which fortunately I had on, and I squeezed through my hands. As I squeezed through my hands, I then realized that there were thousands of them in the water. To cut a very long story short, I was hit by five box jellyfish across my forearm. The other fishermen with me had full wetsuits on and rubber hoods and booties because they found the water was cold at night and were protected by them. Unfortunately, again that night, I put Vaseline petroleum jelly over my forearm and over my face because sea lice had been biting me in the tropics, and I tried some way, rather than putting a steamer on, to try and protect me. So this may have helped me. 
So the toxin didn't penetrate to the, the virility it should have. People who have been hit in the throat will be dead in three minutes. People who have been hit on the extremities, 10, 15 minutes, coma, and then cessation of life. But the, t- uh, but the fishermen saw me, and as they dragged me into the fishing boat, they saw my arm and told me that one of them would kill me. They went, on visa, pardon, c'est fini, allez, allez, vitement, catch my hospital. As they told me to urinate on my arm, I peeled my wetsuit off because I could hardly breathe. By the time I hit the beach, I was already paralyzed in the half, half my body. I collapsed. The child dragged me up the beach to the main road. And by the time an ambulance had arrived, I'd gone through the death rattles. I had um, <laughs> terrible um, shaking, incredible dehydration and paralysis through my entire body. As they raced me towards the hospital, I began to see my whole life flash before me. I thought, this happens just before you die. I was an atheist. I had no belief in God. But as I was lying there wondering if there was life after death, I saw a clear vision of someone appear in front of me. I saw my mum. My mum was the only Christian in the family. And she prayed for me every day. I tried to convince her that God wasn't real, but thank God she didn't listen to me. At the age of 26, lying in an ambulance with my life flashed before me, my mum began to pray. And I had no idea on the other side of the world that my mum had been shown my face, told by God that her eldest son Ian was nearly dead and to pray for him now. How many mothers seem to know when their children are in trouble, even though they're a million miles away? Most men wouldn't have a clue what's going on. But my mother, who believed, began to pray. In this clear vision, she said, Ian, no matter how far from God you may be, no matter what you've done wrong in your life, son, if you call out to God from your heart, God will hear you and God will forgive you. As I lay there and I thought, well, I've seen so many different religions, so many different gods. If there is one, show me your face and I will believe. I need to see to believe. As I lay there, no face appeared except my mother. I thought, well, mother is not God. But my mother prays to Jesus Christ. Could she be right? How many hate her when your mother's right? (laughs) I lay there and I thought, well, my mother has an incredible gentleness. If there is a God out there, she emulates the most beautiful love. She's a pure woman. Perhaps she believes in the true living God. I thought if it's a Christian God, what on earth would a heathen like me pray that's been there and done that? Although when I was a little boy, my mother used to pray the Our Father's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer by my bedside every night. I thought, I've got nothing to lose. Perhaps I should pray that. As I began to pray, my mind went completely blank. My mother said, son, do not pray from your head. You call out to God from your heart. I thought, mum, my heart's like stone. You can strike a match on it. I don't know if there's anything good left in it. And I said, but God, if you see me, I feel like a hypocrite praying, having denied your existence for so long. But if you can hear me, if you see anything good in my heart, please help me to pray. As I said that, words appeared inside the ambulance. Forgive us our trespasses and sins. I thought I have so many sins. How could God possibly forgive me all my sins? I said, God, if you can hear me, I have no way I can listen because there are too many. But if you can somehow forgive a man like me, please forgive me all of my sins. The words disappeared. Fresh words came up. Forgive those who have trespassed and sinned against you. I thought, well, I can do that. I'm not revengeful by nature. I'm not vindictive. As I said that, two men's faces appeared in front of me. I thought, what the are they doing here? Have you got anyone on your hit list? (laughs) Well, as I saw these two men, the voice who had been leading me through the prayer began to ask me specifically for what they'd done to me, whether I could forgive them. I thought, no, not these men. No. I then realized I was in a catch-22. If I did not forgive them from my heart, I'd get no more of the prayer. And I'd been brought up a Church of England Anglican christened and confirmed like some of my Catholic friends when you had to stand up, sit down and kneel. (laughs) The trouble was, as I lay there, I realized that the person I was talking to could be Almighty God. And if I didn't forgive them from my heart, I'd get no more of the prayer. In fact, later I found in the Bible, Jesus teach, if you don't forgive others who have sinned against you, their sins, 
your heavenly father will not forgive your sins against him. In other words, your repentance was conditional upon you forgiving others. Your unforgiveness would nullify your repentance. How many realize when Jesus hung on the cross, he said these incredible words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I lay them and I thought, well, these men maybe did know what they were doing, but can I still forgive them? I said, God, if you can forgive me, which is a very difficult thing, I will forgive these men. I will never touch them. I'll never lay my hands upon them. I realize now as I forgave them, I wasn't saying what they did was right, but what I was doing was releasing the bitterness and the hatred and anger with inside me. It's like a cancer that can eat you up. Unforgiveness can destroy you, can absolutely destroy you. It can actually make more damage than just what they've done to you. I lay there and I forgave them. I found this incredible release. Next minute, their faces disappeared. Fresh words came up. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I thought, God's will be done? Well, it's been my will. I'm independent. I'm self-sufficient. I've done it my way for many years. How on earth could I humble myself and surrender my life to God? I've never done this. And God, whatever you're doing in heaven has got nothing to do with my lifestyle on earth. But God, I will try, if you can help me through this experience, to follow you. I surrender my life to you. Here I became, a part of the prayer was when I made Christ Lord. Not only Savior and forgive me of my sins, but I actually surrendered my life to the Lordship of Christ. Thy will be done, not mine. As I prayed that, the entire Lord's Prayer came before me. What struck me when I saw the entire Lord's Prayer, I prayed it through. And for the first time in my life, I understood what it meant. Prior to that, I'd been praying like a parrot. Meaningless repetition, following religious prayers, but with nothing intent on the heart. I felt the most incredible peace said to me right there on that ambulance. I thought, I wonder how many men literally find God just before they die. You must be very careful not to judge people. Because none of you know who's praying for them. They may have a thousand people wishing them dead and hate them, but it only takes one praying mum for God to listen to. God's heard enough anger and hatred and venom towards humanity. He loves because his mercy triumphs over his judgment. He wishes none to perish. So you be very, very careful. You know no idea what a man will do in his heart. And this peace entered me and it hasn't left me in 35 years. Jesus said, I am the Prince of Peace. Peace I give you, not of this world. I felt the incredible peace enter me. I didn't need a certificate of christening or baptism. I had a peace that was written into my heart right there on the spot. And it has never left me. He put his spirit within me as I lay there in that ambulance. Suddenly the doors opened. And suddenly I was confronted with the fact I was still fighting for my life. I was at the accident emergency. They raced me into the hospital, tried to take my blood pressure, no pulse, tried another machine, no pulse. Nurses and doctors frantically began to slap my hand. Veins are gone, trying to get drip feed in, trying to get a line in. They were manually trying to massage it up into my forearm. Next photograph, as, they, as I'm lying there, I could hear them speaking, but I could no longer respond. I couldn't move any part of my body except my eyelids. The neurotoxin, which is so vicious, goes for the kill. And literally, I was on the edge of death. The doctor said, do not close your eyes, son, or you will die. As I lay there, I had no strength to keep awake. I thought I must take a power nap. How many have done those kind of power? So I shut my eyes, and as I did, the machines monitoring my heart flatlined. In a split second, I found a release, as though the battle to stay alive had finished. I could literally feel myself come out of my physical form. What was so bizarre was that I was dead, but yet I was alive. How many have heard of people looking down upon corpses and they can hear and see all that's going on? Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they shall live. What was dead? The physical shell, the body, the ash, the dust, the, the, the clay vessel was dead, but I was very much alive. In the second in time, I was out of the hospital in complete darkness. As it went pitch black, I thought, did I actually just die and leave my body? Well, if we had a power cut in the cerebral hospital and we've lost the lights. So I turned around trying to adjust because I was a night dive. I was used to pitch dark conditions. 
and it was pitch black. And as I'm looking around, I couldn't literally see any kind of uh, light. And I thought, well, where's the light switch? You ever slept at a friend's place and need to go to the loo? I couldn't find a wall. So I went back towards my hospital bed, couldn't find it. I thought, now you've lost your bed, you idiot. <laughs> I was so dark in here, you can't see your hand in front of your face. As I brought my right hand towards my face, my hand went straight through my face. I thought, you can't miss your face. Two hands. Both hands went straight through my face. I went from my chest, my hands. To my shock and amazement, I was out of my physical body. I thought, how can you feel it's there, but when you go to touch it, it's not? Then I remember how my grandfather had visited some of his old um, men he had fought with in World War II. Some had legs missing and arms missing. Some of the old men would say, scratch my foot, Sonny. And there was nothing there. What they were feeling was their spiritual body with their physical body missing. I then realized I could literally be dead in a realm of complete darkness. And I thought, what is this place? Cold, evil presence, like invisible eyes were looking at me. I then had voices of men in the darkness yelling at me, shut up. I said, I said, nothing. You deserve to be here. I said, deserve to be where? You're in hell. Now shut up. I said, hell? I don't believe in it. If this is hell, where's the party? How many of you be very hard to grab a beer? Very hard to pull, pull a bong. <laughs> How many know it'd be very hard to have sex? Can't touch this, can you? <laughs> so I'm standing out of my body in complete darkness, realizing my concept of hell was everything you couldn't do up here, you could do down here, and I beat the mosh party. And I thought, well, hell, wasn't it rotting corpses, Dante Inferno, little guys running around with red jumpsuits and horns and trident pitchforks, put another one on the barbie? I'm standing there going, Where are the, where's the fire? Where's the brimstone? Where are the maggots? Then I realize that your physical body, if it's not there, how on earth can maggots eat it? But Jesus often spoke in mysteries and parables. He talked about the worm not devouring the flesh. He talked in Galatians about what? The fruit of the flesh, the desires of men's heart, is immorality, drunkenness, perversions, adulteries. But of course, if you've lost your physical form, you can't fulfill the desires of your flesh. So the parable is true. The metaphor is true. Does that make sense? You haven't got maggots trying to eat physical form because it's a spiritual body out of its physical form. I'm thinking, where on earth the fire? Well, I'd never read a Bible. I had no idea that death and Hades would be cast into a lake of fire, but that's not happened yet because Jesus hasn't returned. And it says that Lucifer hates the fire. In Ezekiel 28, verse 18, God consumed his angelic body with fire and turned him to ash. Because we don't fight against flesh and blood. The demons, fallen angels, have no physical form because they have been literally consumed, a third of the angels, by the fire and presence of God when he judged a third of the angels who turned in the heavenly realm. But the angels who are around, the two-thirds, have a form because we can literally meet with them and entertain angels unannounced. Mary met with an angel. We find that Peter met with angels, Paul. So I'm standing out of my physical form in a kingdom of darkness with no light. How many have heard that Lucifer rules the kingdom of darkness? Acts 26, 18. In the midst of the darkness, beautiful, pure light peers through from above. Light often dissipates from its source, but this light concentrated towards me. As it touched me, I thought to myself, what is it? In a split second, I found myself being caught up into the light, almost weightless. How many can't wait for Christ to return and for you to be caught up into the air? I just can't wait. Oh, I tell you, bring it on, Lord. But when I stood in that darkness, I, I knew that you wouldn't want your worst enemy to go here. I knew you couldn't tell time. It was literally a, a place where it says, men are held in darkness until the day of judgment. I stood in this darkness and wondering why they couldn't touch me. Why? Because greater is he within me than he's within the world. Nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. In fact, we read Psalm 23 at funerals. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. I had made Jesus Lord and Savior and shepherd of my soul in the Lord's prayer in the ambulance. 
He was walking with me through the valley of the shadow of death. Who holds the keys of death in Hades? Where can I go from his presence? Even if I descend into the lower regions of Sheol, he still will find me because darkness is his light to the Lord. Christ in me. Couldn't touch me. I thank God. As I lifted up into this light, I could see far above me an uh, opening, circular in shape, a tunnel, a passageway between the two kingdoms. The next picture, as I saw this tunnel, I was drawn into it, and the speed of light began moving along towards the source of the radiance. Waves of white light came off the source towards me. The first wave of light that touched me was comfort, a living emotion. Now, I tried Southern Comfort and a few other comforts in my day, but thank God this comfort is the Holy Spirit. The fruit of His Spirit is a comfort. So close, closer than a brother. As this presence flooded me, I thought this is a living light, it's a living emotion. What on earth's down there? Another wave of light came up absolute peace from the tip of my head to the base of my feet. I thought to myself, I couldn't see my hand in that darkness. I wonder if the light, in this radiant light, I can see my form. I turned my head to the right, and to my incredible amazement, here is my hand, my arm, my fingers, but no longer bone and flesh. Flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. We shall be changed. Mortality will take on immortality. First the natural, then the heavenly. First the earthly, then the spiritual. I could see my spiritual body. And now I know why men have lost limbs still feel it. And when they die, they will literally walk. Even if they're born blind, they shall see. I looked and saw my hand. It says God is the father of light and will become sons and daughters of light. (laughs) And flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I came through this tunnel, another wave of light. Incredible joy flooded me. As I came out of this tunnel, I was struck with the enormity of the radiance. It is as though I'd come into the center of the cosmos. I thought this must be surely um, where literally life begins. So bright, but it didn't hurt my eyes. I thought, is there something in there? Which is so my thought was a speech. In fact, it says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So inside the light, I heard the same person who led me through the Lord's Prayer talk to me. He then called me by name. He said, Ian, do you wish to return? I thought, oh my gosh, there is someone in there. It's not just an innate power in the cosmos, which I'd heard from Taoism. I thought I would look back and here is a tunnel going back into darkness. I thought, am I out of my body standing before a being of light who knows my name? Is this reality? Or am I comatized, lying in a hospital bed with endorphins, starvation of oxygen, tripping off my skull? I had no idea that they had physically moved my body from the A&E to the morgue. That I wasn't near dead, I was actually dead. And not just heart dead, but brain dead, because the neurotoxin had gone right through to the central nervous system and taken it out, because it was a neurotoxin. It wasn't a heart attack, it wasn't a drowning, it wasn't an NDE, it was actually clinically dead. No brain wave. How many know that's brain dead? How many feel like you're brain dead anyhow? Lights are on and no one's home. So I stood there and I'm standing before a being of light who's knowing my name, asking if I want to return. I said, look, if I am dead out of my body, I want to go back. I don't even know where I am. He said, Ian, if you return, you must see in a new light. I thought, light, see the light. I am seeing the light. Are you the true light? He responded and he said, Ian, God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1, 5. As he spoke, just like I'd seen the Lord's prayer appear in the ambulance as words of light, words of light came off him through this radiance and I could read them. God is light. I had no idea what 1 John 1, 5 was. I thought it was Roman numerology. Having never read a Bible, I didn't know it was the first epistle of John, chapter 1, verse 5. As I stood there, I thought, well, Buddhism had said yin and yang. God is light and darkness, equal and opposite. I'm staying here having Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, chucked New Age teaching back into the pit of hell where it came from. God is light. And in him there is no darkness. I'm standing before a being of light where I see no darkness. I look behind me because I thought surely I'm casting a shadow. But of course behind me there was none because I was a spiritual being of light and there's no shadow or shifting in the Lord. 
I then came to the stark reality. I'm standing before the true living God, creator of heaven and earth. He knows my name. He knows my thought before I speak. I thought nothing's hidden from him. My entire spiritual being must be laid bare. He must know the intent of my heart and see every disgusting. How many have got a conscience left? How many feel a little bit of shame sometimes and that you're not really worthy and good enough? It just hit me. In fact, Jesus said, men hate coming to the light, lest the evil deeds are exposed. I felt so ashamed, I began to step back towards the darkness. I thought someone has made a dreadful mistake. I've surely been the wrong man up here. I need to crawl back under some rock or go back to hell where I belong. As I began moving back from his presence, waves of radiance broke off the source that surrounded him. As I watched this light come, Pure love and acceptance emanated forth into me. A liquid light that literally filled my vessel up. I could feel wave after wave of this pure love entering me. I could literally feel all shame and guilt being washed off me. As I stood there, I said, but God, don't you know my sins? I thought perhaps he's so old, he doesn't know. I thought I better tell him now, no use coming in and then getting kicked out later. So I said, I have cursed you, I've broken your commandments. How many have broken at least one of the commandments? What a bunch of lies. <laughs> Only half of you. I moved and I said, God, but I've slept around. I've taken a heap of drugs. Every sin I told him, his response was pure love and acceptance. Wave after wave of love to the point where I burst into tears. I hadn't cried since a 12-year-old boy. I'd been taught men don't cry, but I burst. Something inside of me broke and I wept, wept. I couldn't believe how many tears could come out of my eyes. As I stood there, he spoke to me, said, Ian, when you prayed in that ambulance, the Lord's Prayer, I forgave all of your sins. All. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Though my sins be scarlet red, he'll make them what? As white as snow. What is the sting of death? Sin. But the free gift of God is for those who believe in Christ Jesus, eternal life. The sting of death is taken. Sting, where is your power? The sting of death is sin. But thank God Jesus came, Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. On that cross, he had taken every single sin. And he had paid for me. And he loved me. And his love had now filled me to overflowing. Over my eyes, I was surrounded by radiance, which I realized now was pure love. The greatest is love. But I'm what the Jewish call the outer courts. I'm literally standing outside the glorified Savior. Say the Holy Spirit himself glorifies the Son. He gives off fruit of the Spirit to prepare mankind to meet with God himself. The Spirit of God draws us. And as I stood there, I said, God, could I come into this light and see you face to face? I'm sure if I can see you, I can put a name to God. I know you're in there. Could I come into the light that surrounds you? Thank God the veil's been torn. (laughs) Thank God we have entry into the Holy of Holies. Many people who do not know God, God's revealed this light to them because he loves sinners and wishes none to perish. But you cannot come into the light and see the person in the light without the blood of the Lamb. Because only through into the Holy of Holies can you come through the blood of Christ. I now know why people in the Tibetan Book of the Dead have experienced this light, but have not actually come in to see the being of light. They think there's nothing after that. You go into nothingness. I walked into the light as it did the radiance inside of like veils, began to heal my broken heart. This time I cried, but I wasn't sad. (laughs) I didn't know a man could be happy and cry. (laughs) I mean, no men's emotions are down on their feet somewhere. I tell you. Oh, it's again weeping. Why on earth am I weeping? Why? Because he heals the broken heart. The spirit of the Lord's there to heal the heart. He went in where I'd looked for love and ended up with lust and passion and perversion. I was now feeling my heart totally healed. I then watched the light part standing in front of me with bare feet, pure white garments, robes reaching down to his ankles, made up of this cloud of light. I looked up to the chest of a man, his arms outstretched, the robes he was wearing like monk robes, but pure white. And Daniel saw this in Daniel 7. It says his vesture was white. His garments were white like light, Psalm 103, verse 1. And it says that his hair and his vesture, as I lifted my eyes towards his hair, his hair was white, shoulder length. I was amazed because I've never seen an image of God or, or Christ with pure white hair. Always have him brown hair. 
but it says he is glorified. <laughs> his hair is like white, like wool, like snow. As I'm looking towards his face, I realize the source of all the light is coming out of his face. <laughs> it's like eternity within eternity in his face. It's like I knew if he spoke, galaxies, constellations would come into existence. Because Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We are one. He's the exact representation of the invisible God. And you behold his face. It's the glory of the Father revealed in the face of Christ. I then realized what Jesus wasn't just the Son of Man. He was the Son of God. He was actually God incarnate, taking on human form. I was in awe. I could see the light was the source in his face. It's <laughs> amazing. I just, in absolute childlike innocence, just walked towards him. You ever seen the kids up here? How many know you once looked like that? <laughs> How would you like to have childlike innocence restored to you? I walked towards him, light came out of his face, and purity flooded me. Purity. Now, I'd failed in the area of purity. <laughs> Anyone else failed? <laughs> I moved closer, holiness, another abstract word, flooded out of his face. How many know he's coming for a holy, pure bride? How many know none of us can make ourselves holy and pure? That'll take striving out of you. You behold his face. You're changed from glory to glory. Only inside the holy of holies can we be transformed to be the holy, pure bride. It's not just for one person, not just for one priest. All of us now through Christ can come into the holy of holies. I was blown out. I was amazed. He had made me holy. He made me feel like I was a virgin, like I'd never have sex before. And trust me, that is a miracle. (laughs) When I got married seven years later to my dear wife, who was a virgin, I felt as though I'd never, ever had any sexual immorality in my entire life. I felt as though I was clean and pure and holy and undefiled when I went to my honeymoon. I thank God for that because that is an absolute miracle. In fact, I told my wife what I was like before I married. I said, girl, you want to run now? You better run now. She said, I've been in church all my life here, and I think I trust you more than most men in church. At least you're honest. <laughs> so I walked in, and the next minute, Jesus, arms outstretched, face shining like the sun. In the next photograph, I told this in Taiwan. Uh, was it last year? Go back one. And this particular Chinese girl with the graphic arts tried to do this on her computer, <laughs> an 18-year-old kid. Because almost all of them have Jesus the Son of Man, not the Son of God glorified. In fact, it says the light around him is so bright in the new heavens and new earth, you won't need the light of the sun or the moon or the stars because his glory will cover the heavens. (laughs) As the waters cover the earth, his glory will cover the heavens. (laughs) It's not this little light of mine. It's not some insipid glow coming from an icon. It's not a halo. He is glorified. He is the light of the world. (laughs) I walked up to see him face to face and didn't know that no man sees the face of God and lives. I believe had I seen his face, I'd be not permitted to come back because without faith, it's impossible to please him. I could see his form and glory, but if I saw him face to face, which the scriptures say we will eventually, I would have to remain there. Jesus then stepped aside and says, he is the door. He says, he is the door. Those who come to him shall come in and in and out and find green pastures. He is the door into eternity. He said, I'm the way, the truth and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So there's not many ways. Jesus said, I am the only way. No one comes to the Father but by me. He is the door and the light at the end of the tunnel. And if you've ever surfed, you realize trying to get into the tube, that barrel that you get into was only used for kings of Hawaii, the reality was in the natural, that tunnel of light I traveled down was almost the same in the natural of getting into a tube. And that's why men get so hooked on it. It was more addictive than drugs getting barreled. I saw some surf out there this morning. And I stood there in the presence of Christ as he stepped aside. What struck me was behind him were fields and pastures. The light of Christ was upon all of creation. I saw flowers with the most incredible light. Having done agronomy, I realized in, in, in veterinary science, I realized that there was no sickness or disease in the pastures. They were literally alive. It was like a garden. I saw mountains and blue sky and crystal clear stream. And I couldn't believe how it was like you're looking through air. And and God said, this is a river of life. He said, I've created a new earth. I've created a new heaven. How many know that this kingdom is not his kingdom? 
When Pontius Pilate asked him, he said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, they'd fight for me. But I go and prepare in my father's place. This earth will pass away. Don't you think it's going to be terraformed and spoken back into existence again? It's a new earth. He said, that's why I go to be with my father and you shall be with me. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I saw a new earth, a new crystal clear river. And thank God the new Jerusalem's coming out of the new heaven onto the new earth. The old earth won't be here anymore. The old Jerusalem will be gone. You've gone quiet on me. (laughs) I'm nearly finished. Jesus then came right back in front of me. As Christ came back in front of me, the door into eternity closed. He said, Ian, now that you've seen, do you wish to remain here or do you wish to return? What would you do? Chatswood? Maybe from Manly or Curl Curl. D.Y. Cronulla, who knows? I'm staying here and I'm looking at paradise. And I realize that if I choose to go back, I am literally forfeiting an opportunity to step in. No more sickness, no more disease, no more war, no more demons, no more pain. And thank God we then get a heavenly body put on our spiritual body. Because we're not just going to walk around as supernatural beings of light. We will be clothed with immortality, a heavenly body. As I stood there, he, he didn't move. I said, I'm not, I've got no one to return for. No one loves me. I'm not married. I have no children or none that I know of. As I stood there, I was ruthlessly honest before him. He didn't move. I was about to throw myself across the try line. <laughs> Played a lot of rugby. And then I, he said, I look back. God, show me one person. How many love their mother? If she's sitting next to you. Forgive her. <laughs> so I love her. I'm not a mummy's boy, but when I saw her, I thought, if I am dead and this is real, I have to go back. It would absolutely just dis- destroy her to think that her son would go on to hell. Anyone who's a believer to see their children going off from God, I understand why they weep. I understand. My mother never gave up hope and continued to pray. I thought if I went in here, she would have no idea. They'd bury my corpse and have no idea. I knew the door would close and I could not communicate any longer. As I stood there, I said, God, I want to go back. I want to tell her what she believes in is real. God said, if you return, you must see things in a new light. Right behind them, my mum and dad appeared, my brother, my sister, hundreds of thousands of people, multitudes of people. He said to me, Ian... I want you to go back and tell them what you've seen because many will not step foot inside a church any longer to hear my name. I said, but God, I don't know them. I don't love them. I love my mother. I'll go back for her. He said, Ian, I love them. I desire all of them to come to know me. I said, God, that's too hard for me to comprehend. It's hard enough to love one person. How on earth can you love the entire world? As I look back again, I thought, how do I go back into darkness, into my body? He said, tilt your head in, open your eyes and see. I was back in my body on a slab in a morgue. A doctor freaking out as his corpse came alive. (laughs) Nurses freaking out. I was freaking out. I was thinking, did I just see God was all that real? The doctor said, you've been dead for 15 to 20 minutes. We've done nothing to bring you back. I said, God, if that's true and I've been dead that long, I need another miracle. Can you heal my body or I will literally be on a machine the rest of my life? I felt power like electricity go through my body. Where death had come in through my feet, life was coming in from the top of my head. Wave after wave of resurrection power. Within a, within a few hours, my body was completely healed. I walked out of the hospital the next day. Thank God he heals. The fishermen thought I was a ghost come back from the dead and ran. They're involved in voodoo. They couldn't believe I was alive. I flew back to New Zealand. And as I'm flying back and listening to men at work, and I think it was Steely Dan, or I was thinking on my Walkman. And as I'm listening to it, I said, God, what's happened to me? Over the sound of my music of cold chisel and men at work, he said, you're a reborn Christian. I took my headphones off and looked around. There was no one there. So I put my dark glasses on and freaked out. I thought, what's a reborn Christian? 
heard of Catholics and Anglicans, Baptists. What's reborn? Do you have to die and come back to life? He said, no, son, you were dead in your sins, but you were born again when you prayed the Lord's Prayer from your heart. He said, when you call out from your heart, son, I will come in the inner part. He said, I've made you with my hands. I'm not interested in buildings. I've made you. You're the temple. I want to live in you. That's why I've come to save you. The kingdom of God's within you to take you home. Same resurrection power that rose Christ from the dead dwells within me, Christ in me, the hope of glory. That even though I die, yet I shall live. He said, Ian, you don't have to wait until you die to experience the presence of God. You can have it right here on earth. He said, lift up your eyes, open your heart. I walked into a church that had the glory of God. It was in revival in Hamilton, New Zealand. And I was baptized in water by a Messianic Jew. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak in new tongues. My entire life was changed. Oh, I'm sorry, gone over time, Phil. But I love God. I love Him with all my heart. And I can't wait to get out of here. <laughs> Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast show. If you've enjoyed it, please share it with your friends, tell people about it. I'd love to get these messages out there. You can also connect with me on Facebook at Kirsty Salisbury Official. And you can subscribe to receive updates for new episodes as they come about. I'm Kirsty Salisbury and this is Let's Talk Near Death. Mm-hmm.